Hello and welcome to episode 14 of my sports and exercise science series. We're going to be following on from episode 13 by beginning to learn about the long-term adaptations of aerobic training. By the end of this episode, you will understand the long-term adaptations to the cardiovascular, muscular and respiratory systems. Let's start with the long-term adaptations of training on the cardiovascular system. Aerobic training results in cardiac hypertrophy, an increase in size and volume of the left ventricle in particular occurs. This increases stroke volume and cardiac output, allowing a greater volume of blood to be ejected from the heart, thus providing more oxygen for the athlete to use. Cardiac hypertrophy also leads to an increase in capillarization of the heart muscle itself. The increased supply of blood and oxygen allows the heart to beat more strongly and effectively during both exercise and rest. Other adaptations include increased heart rate recovery rates, meaning that the heart rate will return to resting levels in a much shorter time than an untrained individual. This is because of the greater efficiency of the cardiovascular system to reduce energy aerobically. Another adaptation is increased blood volume and haemoglobin levels. Red blood cells may increase in number and the haemoglobin content and the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood may also rise. There is also an increased ratio of plasma in the blood cells which reduces the viscosity of the blood allowing it to flow more smoothly through the blood vessels. This allows for greater amounts of oxygen to be delivered to the muscles and used by an athlete. Aerobic training leads to an increased capillarization of skeletal muscle. Greater capillary supply means increased blood flow and a greater surface area for gas diffusion to take place. Increasing the oxygen and nutrients into muscles allows for more removal of byproducts. Finally, another long-term adaptation to training causes a decreased heart rate at rest and during submaximal workloads. A greater stroke volume results in the heart not having to beat as often to supply the required blood flow and oxygen to the body. Aerobic training can also result in a slower increase in heart rate during exercise. Now let's move on to the long-term adaptations of training to the muscular system. First off, we have an increased size and number of mitochondria. Mitochondria are the sites of aerobic ATP resynthesis and where glycogen and triglyceride stores are oxidized. The greater the number and size of mitochondria located within the muscle, the greater the ability to resynthesize ATP aerobically. Next is increased myoglobin stores. Myoglobin is responsible for extracting oxygen from the red blood cells and delivering it to the mitochondria in the muscle cell. An increase in the number of myoglobin stores increases the amount of oxygen delivered to the mitochondria for energy production. There is also increased fuel storage and oxidative enzymes. Aerobic training increases the muscular storage of glycogen and triglycerides in the slow twitch muscle fibers. And there is also an increase in the oxidative enzymes that are responsible for metabolizing these fuel stores to produce ATP aerobically. This means that there is less reliance upon the anaerobic glycolysis system until higher intensities. In addition to this, due to the increased levels of enzymes associated with fat metabolism, an aerobically trained athlete is able to glycogen spare more effectively and therefore work at higher intensities for longer. Long-term aerobic training also causes increased muscle oxygen utilization. All of the aforementioned factors contribute to the body's ability to attract oxygen into the muscle cells and then use it to produce adenosine triphosphate, known as ATP, for muscle contraction. A measure of this is the difference in the amount of oxygen in the arterioles in comparison to the venules. Finally, we have increased muscle fiber adaptation. Some research has indicated that skeletal muscle fast twitch type 2A can take on some of the characteristics of slow twitch as an adaptation of aerobic training. This would allow for greater ability to generate ATP aerobically with fewer fatiguing factors. Finally, we have the long-term adaptations to the respiratory system, which are an increased alveolar surface, meaning increased pulmonary diffusion. Aerobic training increases the surface area of the alveoli, which in turn increases the pulmonary diffusion, allowing more oxygen to be extracted and transported to working muscles for use. There is also an increase in tidal volume. Aerobic training increases the amount of air inspired and expired by the lungs per each breath. 
This allows for greater amounts of oxygen to be diffused into the surrounding alveoli capillaries and to be delivered to the working muscles. Finally, we have increased ventilation during maximal exercise. Aerobic training results in more efficient lung ventilation. Ventilation may be slightly reduced at rest and during submaximal exercise due to the improved oxygen utilization. At maximal workloads, ventilation is increased due to an increase in tidal volume and respiratory frequency. This allows for greater oxygen delivery to working muscles at maximum exercise intensities. To finish this episode, we're going to take a look at a case study. What would we expect the neuromuscular adaptations of a bodybuilder to be in comparison to a desk worker that has never trained? Firstly, the bodybuilder would be training for muscular hypertrophy. This means that we can expect the bodybuilder to have an increase in the total quantity of actin and myosin protein filaments, the size and number of myofibrils, and also the amount of connective tissue that surrounds the muscle. This allows the muscle to create a greater amount of strength and power with each contraction. The bodybuilder would have an increased synchronization of motor units, which means an increase in the ability for a number of different motor units to fire at the same time and an improved ability to recruit larger motor units that require a larger stimulus to activate. The ability to recruit more motor units at the same time and stimulate larger motor units creates a more powerful muscular contraction. The bodybuilder would also have an increase in the firing rate of motor units. An increase in the frequency of stimulation of a given motor unit increases the rate of force development or how quickly a muscle can contract maximally. This is beneficial for rapid ballistic movements where maximal force is required in a very short period of time. Finally, the bodybuilder would have a reduction in inhibitory signals. The improved coordination of the agonists, antagonists and synergists is thought to allow for the reduced inhibitory effect. The reduction in inhibitory mechanisms allows for a greater force production within a muscle group. That concludes the 14th episode of my sports and exercise science series. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and don't forget to like and subscribe for more free and educational content. You've been watching UK Fitness Hub. I've been Travis Tarrant and I'll see you in the next episode where we begin study on VO2 max and high altitude training.